humans are just monkeys who wear clothes, bears who shave, wolves who cook their meat. There was a time I had lofty notions about humanity. We humans can think fancy thoughts, feel fancy feelings, dream up things like God and history and the future. But all that human hubris left me when I had my first baby. <laughs> my pregnancy was unremarkable. Some of it was even fun. Prenatal yoga, lists of names, test driving strollers. I had labor all mapped out in my imagination. How I'd feel the contractions building at a steady pace, bake cookies for the hospital team during the first phase, and arrive at triage with just enough time to push the baby out through my vagina, totally unmedicated, <laughs> like a champion. <laughs> the midwife would hand me my sweet, naked child wrapped in rainbows as I wept and shimmered. A beautiful birth story reserved for fairies and mermaids. Three days of labor. <laughs> Roaring, shaking, bawling, panicking. 20 hours begging for a cesarean. While the midwife said no, over and over. She told me, in no uncertain terms, that my body could do this on its own. I could feel the fetus moving down through my pelvis ready to start living, but my cervix never stretched itself out fully. Pushing would be dangerous. Finally, they cut me open, shoved all my muscles and organs aside, and pulled that baby out of me. I came face to face with this tiny, wriggling critter, wrinkly and angry, with a big mop of dark hair and nails like tiny daggers. That was when my animal self emerged from my mangled sense of reality. I wasn't a person anymore, lying in that clean hospital bed. What was I? A gutted fish? A gutted fish stapled to a deflated balloon? No, I was something else. I was bandaged, bleeding from various wounds, with compression devices on my legs and a tube in my urethra. And this little creature with an umbilical stump for a belly button on my chest, trying so hard to get food. Pregnancy is just the beginning. You grow a new human made entirely out of you, and then after it's born, you're still on the hook for growing it. The food that I ate turned into milk in my boobs and went into this creature, kind of like a bird regurgitating dinner for her brood. Somehow the milk comes from your blood. My blood becomes the milk. And my body burns 500 calories a day to make it all happen. Did you know that the American Association of Pediatrics recommends breastfeeding for two years? That's a toddler walking up to you, pulling your shirt down when they'd like a snack. I didn't have to nurse this baby. I could have opted for formula instead, but I wanted to. I dreamed of a sunny maternity leave day, sitting quietly at a cafe, reading a good book, sipping a latte while nursing a sweet, quiet baby. I couldn't have my fairy tale birth, but maybe I could still have this. For the first five days, there was no milk coming out of me. My medical chart read delayed lactogenesis. Then suddenly I shot from no milk to too much milk. It was getting stuck in my ducts. And because the baby couldn't drink it fast enough, the stuck milk turned into a painful breast infection called mastitis. You've been there. After beating the infection with two rounds of antibiotics, I thought I had turned a corner, but no. For a few months after that, every now and then, I would have random insane pains shooting through my breasts, bringing tears to my eyes. It's called vasospasms. <laughs> my breasts hurt most of the time. They were sore and sensitive and constantly in danger. Too much compression or not enough nursing, and I would develop milk clogs. This is a fairly common problem that modern medicine shows no interest in addressing. You can call your OB. They will have nothing at all to offer. All remedies come from the old wives. 
passed down through secret networks of nurses who have survived these crises. If you've never experienced a milk clog, imagine hardened lumps of toothpaste stuck inside the tube, except the tube is your chest. You can't see them, but they feel like frozen peas under your skin. Now imagine a vein of these stuck frozen peas stretching from your armpit to your nipple. <laughs> That's what was happening to me. The traditional cures still recommended and practiced include hot compress, hot compress with castor oil, massage the clog out, massage it out in a hot shower, massage it out with an electric toothbrush, soak whole boob in a pot of warm salty water, then massage the clog out, something called dangle feeding, and having a good friend suck the clog out for you. To prevent clogs, I was topless for the better part of a year. It was not sexy. <laughs> it was a medical necessity. Putting on any sort of shirt was like sandpaper on my nipples. Every bra put me at risk for more clogs. When family and friends came to visit to meet the little vampire bat, I did not have the decency to tie up my open bathrobe. People I did not know very well got to see me, got decked out in my finest pajama pants and fuzzy socks, swollen, angry tits, leaking milk everywhere. <laughs> did I mention the baby was colicky? <laughs> For those of you unfamiliar with colic, it isn't a medical condition. There's nothing wrong with the baby. The baby just cries all the time all the time for the first three months of his life. He'd sleep for a couple of hours, then wake up crying. He cried while he nursed, and he didn't have a cute cry. His was more like a pterodactyl scream. It was the kind of sound that bypassed your frontal cortex and went straight into your brainstem. They say, swaddle him. He broke out of swaddles like a mantis shrimp. They say, do baby wearing. If I wore him for too long, he'd fall asleep on my chest and I'd clog up again. They say, try white noise. This worked for us. The only thing that reliably soothed the savage baby was the sound of a hairdryer. <laughs> when I was three weeks postpartum, my mother called me. She was concerned. I had never planned on having a bris for this baby, but I hadn't even managed to put together a little naming ceremony. I had not done any of the traditional Jewish new baby celebration things. My mother said to me in a fret, aren't you enjoying your baby? <laughs> I asked her, which part should I be enjoying? There was no joy with this baby but there was an understanding of mutually assured destruction if we couldn't make it work. We needed each other. It was animal need. I was food. He kept my boobs from exploding. Our situation was desperate. This was how we bonded. Night followed day, day followed night, and time flowed on. Animals don't reflect on their struggles. I beat each day by living until tomorrow. I sunk down into the couch, nursing pillow on my lap, critter on the nursing pillow. We watched many seasons of The Office like this. <laughs> I would occasionally get up to pee while he screamed at me for momentarily walking away. I fed us both all day. I faced down each night, bracing myself for sleeping only an hour or two at a time with the creature burrowed in my armpit he would not tolerate anything as quaint as a bassinet. We kept on eating and sleeping and breathing in sync. We had a board book, a gift from my dad called Welcome Little One. It began on the day you were born. It was love at first sight. I hated reading this book to the critter because it was a lie. 
It was not love at first sight. It took many sights and many days <laughs> before that chemical reaction sparked. Five days after the birth slash surgery, I had my first real alone time with this new animal. So we did what the doctors recommend. It's called skin to skin. I lay down on, in bed, topless, little animal wearing just a diaper on my bare chest. And I fell asleep. And he fell asleep. And I woke up a few hours later flooded with oxytocin. I was high out of my mind on postpartum hormones. My partner came into the room to check on us. I hollered, take off your shirt, cuddle this baby. You gotta get a hit off this baby. It's amazing. <laughs> At some point during these difficult days, a thought crystallized and I was never able to shake it. This was my cub. Baby sounds too innocent, too helpless, and he was not. He was wild. He was powerful. He was a force to be reckoned with, and so was I. In that moment, me, mostly naked, curled up in my lair, feeding my cub, he and I were pure mammal, all milk, teeth, and muscles. We belonged to each other. Just as I was getting the hang of things, I went back to work. It was absurd. Me sitting at a desk in front of a computer, looking regular people in the eye and speaking intelligible words. I was a porcupine in a dress, an amoeba in a chair. What was this body I was living in that kept growing and shrinking with all these lumpy and soft parts that were totally unfamiliar? Where was my center of gravity? I spent hours away from the cub who needed proximity to me for his very survival. I brought my breast pump with me. It's a portable machine, a little smaller than a bowling ball, that hooks up to the tits and draws the milk out. It's the same technology as how you get milk out of a cow. Except unlike the cow, I was doing this voluntarily, hooking this device up to myself, to my very own udders. When I had been back at work for a few weeks, I found myself in a casual chat with the big boss. He asked me, so, are you back to normal? <laughs> oh, Grandpa Boss Man, there was no normal anymore. Normal was long gone. I was no longer at the center of my own existence. My cub got bigger. As a newborn, his skinny limbs never stopped moving. He had never had that chubby cherub look. He was a lean, mean baby machine constantly in motion. He pulled himself to standing before he could crawl. He could climb the furniture before he could walk. The cub's hair grew uncontrollably, a baby mane. There's a Jewish tradition that you don't cut a boy's hair until their third birthday. I didn't plan on waiting that long, but I wanted to hold off as long as I could. Finally, a couple of weeks after his first birthday, while we were at a playground, something gross got stuck in his hair gum, mushy banana, I didn't investigate too closely. The only thing to do was to cut out the goop. With one lock gone, it was time for a first haircut, no way around it. Despite the adorable children's salon with the animal crackers and the TV playing Pixar movies, the cub cried throughout the whole ordeal. He sat in my lap face to face with me, smock draped over both of us and cried it out. It wasn't like his early colic screams. It was a lamentation. I lamented too. I looked at him and I was shocked. My cub, my wild creature squeezed into a person-shaped cookie cutter. You can't go back from a first haircut. No matter how much you let your hair grow out, there will always be evidence of human meddling in something nature made. I looked at my cub all neat and trim and saw the future. He wouldn't be mine forever. He'd be a member of society someday and then he'd belong to the world. He'd go to school, he'd sit at a desk, do homework, learn to drive, fall in love, do his taxes. He'd transition from creature to citizen. What would become of our feral freedom? 
Now, he's just turned four. He can count his fingers, sing the alphabet, spell his own name, and cling to, he still clings to me like a koala. Parrots every word he hears, shrieks like a howler monkey when he doesn't get his way, and burrows into bed next to me when he has a bad dream. So, our story continues. I don't know yet what I've learned, but when the world is too much, and it is always too much, all I wanna do is snuggle under a blanket with him, and he gives me his stuffed dinosaur, and he plays the lion, and we make them talk to each other. The lion says, roar, roar. The dinosaur replies, roar, roar, roar. <laughs> Heidi Handelsman, everybody. Heidi Handelsman. <laughs>